Hello. If you talk into that, then we're going to put it straight to YouTube. Okay. Are we, are we waiting for a few people to come back, or should we begin? Okay. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Terry Collinsworth, and I'm the director of the International Rights Advocates. I am a human rights lawyer, which, me which means that... Uh, I spend my time trying to solve problems that I, I think have been caused by a company, a government, somebody who is systematically abusing the human rights of a group of people or uh, just gotta check it. Sorry, carry on. I'm just gonna... A group of people uh, over resources. Uh, I spend most of my time going to places where human rights abuses are permitted to one, one, one. Test, test. The U.S. No, actually, I leave that to my friend, the American Civil War. But uh, this is unusual for me to be in such a beautiful place. I want to thank Charlotte for organizing this. This is a real treat to be uh, uh, in a place that is this beautiful. Um, I today I'm going to talk about. One of my cases, it's against uh, Nestle, Cargill, and we're about to also sue Mars, uh, Hershey's, Barry Calibut, and Mondelez for using child slaves to harvest cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire. And the case, it's, it's, it's a case study of how you confront corporate power. It's also a story of frustration and being thwarted at every corner. We're, we're making progress, but I first sued these companies in 2005, and we keep winning, but they have done everything possible to make this last forever. So I'm going to show you some of the processes that we've used, and I think that this is a, a, a great case to talk about how do you and is it possible to actually confront corporate power in a very concentrated way? Beginning in the 1990s, it became known, I don't know why no one knew this before, that cocoa in the cocoa, which is where a big chunk of the world's cocoa comes from, uh, was being harvested primarily by child slaves. And it, became, it was very easy then to go there at this time and just take pictures of kids doing this. And my organization did one of the first reports in uh, early 2000s that documented that there was no question that this cocoa industry that was 90% dominated by these big multinationals relied upon child slaves to get their cocoa there. People began to notice and uh, trying to document it. Uh, Mickey Mastrada, who's going to be here uh, later today, did two films, and he, we're working on a third one together. Uh, but the, the word got out there on the street that this was a, a phenomenal problem. And again, I, I just always have to stress, this was not a situation where we came upon child laborers on a family farm, working for their parents. They were part of a giant corporate conglomerate system that was relying upon their labor to give all of the rich people in the world chocolate bars. The companies were first confronted, and this is true in every situation I've been in, from Nike to the cocoa companies to the rubber companies. They have this 
joint, they must meet. They must sit down together and say, well, what do you do when you get caught red-handed using child slaves? Well, they have a couple of things they always do. They say, well, we have no control over our suppliers. And in the situation of Coco, they controlled 90% of the market. If they told everybody to wear a red hat the next day, they would because they owned those people. But they always say that, oh, we can't, we have no control. Then, oh, we just buy the beans. It's like we're strangers. We just show up, there's beans in the market, and we buy them. But they always add that we are strongly opposed to child labor. So we heard this for a few years. It takes time to really get people to care about this problem. So the corporations got away with this. And this is all part of intent, too. We're going to get to intent. But all these nice people who go to work every day for Cargill and Nestle, they had intent here. They knew what was going on, and their goal became continuing to do it without having to make any changes. So in 2001, after we collected all the evidence, it was our organization, we found a couple of members of Congress, including uh, Bernie Sanders, who at that time was on my board of directors. He was a mere congressman before he became a superstar politician. He introduced a bill to ban the importation of cocoa made harvested by child labor. It was a very simple idea that we didn't want slave produced products coming into our market. We have the right to do that. This passed, at that time we had a Congress I could work with, that's why we were based in Washington. This passed the Congress 291 to 115. That means a lot of Republicans voted for it too. It was almost bipartisan. Child slavery is bad. It seemed like an easy concept to grasp. They, they passed the law. So in our system, it had to go over to the Senate. And by the time it did that, we had caught the, co the cocoa companies by surprise. By the time it went over to the Senate, they were ready. And so they got all their lobbyists together and they went over there and they blocked it. They, they, they talked to the people in, in the Senate and they said, oh, that's just not a good idea. Uh, we, we need something that the companies can participate in and so on. So they came up with this idea of a voluntary initiative called the Harkin Engel Protocol, where the companies convinced the Congress to put them in charge of stopping their own use of child slavery. It, we, it was a voluntary protocol and it was passed in 2001. So that's a stopping point there. It's like, yes, that is a reality that we had a simple very obvious problem. The corporate lobbyists came in, they threw their money around, and they turned a, a very simple bill into an advantage for the companies. They now had the control over their own processes once again. So there was little we could do at that time. This was passed. It was the, the structure we had now to confront this problem. So we had to see what they would do. All right, I can't complain about something until I give them a chance, a fair chance, to see what they would do. So what did they do? <laughs> it, it, today, they have given themselves three extensions of time unilaterally. And in 2018, the World Cocoa Federation, which is the, the group that controls all of the, the big companies and they're all working together, they said, we can't do it yet. We, we need more time. And so in 2018, they said, we can't even meet our latest unilateral extension of time to 2020. We need more time. They didn't even set a new time yet. But what they did do is admit that during the period of time between 2001 and today, they continue to use child slaves. They claim they can't stop it. They can't fix it. So they're continuing to profit from child slaves. So I went back to uh, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, in March of 2019 and tried to uh, assess what was going on again, and this is what we saw. There's just nothing changed from the first time that we went to do these reports. These are kids that uh, are trafficked from uh, Mali and uh, Burkina Faso that have been working typically three or four years on these plantations, and they're doing hazardous work. They are using machetes. They are, all of the kids have 
visible scars on their arms because they are whacking into these cocoa pods to open them up. They let me try it and I, I, I really had to use a lot of force to whack open one of these cocoa pods, but they, they had scars. They are using pesticides and herbicides without any training, any masks, anything. And again, they're producing these for the big companies. So most of this is a legal uh, discussion in terms of what we do. I'm going to gloss over that pretty quickly. I just wanted to emphasize a few of the options that we have, but we have to do something. We can't continue to let the companies control their own narrative. And I, I have found in my experiences in all of these sectors that this was unusual that the companies got Congress to give them permission to uh, try to solve their own problem. But one absolute fact, one takeaway is no company, no multinational with power is ever going to give up anything or spend a nickel voluntarily unless you make them. So one of the goals of intervention in the global economy is figuring out what your levers are to require and force the companies to start behaving in the global economy. So the, the, the legal options that we have, I'm going to run through the elements just real quick. This isn't a group of lawyers. Uh, let me start with the alien tort statute. This was passed by our first Congress in 1789. It was part of the first judicial package. We uh, discovered this statute in uh, 1995, we were looking at a problem in, in Burma where Unical and Total were building a pipeline, a natural gas pipeline across Burma, and they were using uh, uh, the villagers at gunpoint. To, they, they partnered with the military regime, then called the Slork in uh, Burma, and they were using villagers to be human minesweepers, and they were making them clear the right of way for the construction of the, uh, the pipeline. And we were trying to figure out how we could bring an action against them. So we found this statute, and it's very simple. It was designed in 1789 to create a forum for uh, crimes on the high seas because the whole economy at that time in 1789 was shipping between Europe and the colonies and then the United States. So it, it created a, a place in the United States where you could sue. And, and the only uh, requirement is that there be a tort that violates the law of nations. And the law of nations really just means universal human rights. So slavery, forced labor, uh, genocide, torture, extrajudicial killing, those are the types of serious extreme crimes that uh, are covered. And with the Unical case, we established that forced labor was uh, a universal violation, and we prevailed in that case. So that's always the first tool that we go to. And we did sue uh, Nestle and Cargill in uh, 2005 based on this statute, the Alien Tort Statute. We have twice been to the Court of Appeals, and we have twice won, very recently the second time. The case is now going back to the trial court. Uh, the, each of the companies has giant law firms, and they figure out how to make this last as long as possible. Uh, but we're, we will prevail in this case, I feel confident. The key issues are th that you have to have an alien, uh, you have to uh, have uh, a law of nations violations. I just want to briefly mention that uh, our Supreme Court, which is tilting very hard to the right these days, has put up two major and, and recent roadblocks for us uh, in two cases. Uh, the first one, uh, Kiobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum, uh, the court said that you have to show that the, this violation of the law of nations, it touches and concerns the United States. So the concern expressed by the companies was it wasn't fair that the events that occurred in far-flung places could be brought back before our courts, and uh, they, they won. The, the court five to four said, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So we have to make sure that it's tied closer to the U.S. So we have to show things like the decisions were made in the United States, the funding came from the United States, the companies were based in the United States, and in the Nestle and uh, Cargill situation, all of those things are true.
Uh, they recently held in, a, in another roadblock for us that uh, you cannot sue a foreign corporation in the United States, that that would cause diplomatic uh, international tensions and stress. So we have to have only uh, U.S. companies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are plenty of U.S. companies that are violating the law of nations that didn't necessarily put us out of business. There's another statute that we are about to use. Uh, it is uh, a, an anti-trafficking statute. Uh, the, the Congress, even the Republican Congress, passed this new anti-trafficking statute, mainly because Christian groups wanted to get at uh, the trafficking of sex uh, victims, uh, children particularly. So the language of the statute is broad enough to cover other violations against children, but that was the motivation for the statute. So all we have to do in this statute is show that uh, the companies knowingly benefited and they received something of value. So using child slaves to harvest your cocoa easily satisfies that. We have to show that they're participating in a venture, and all of these companies together formed the World Cocoa Federation and qualifies under law as a venture, so we have satisfied that. And that uh, they have uh, either used trafficked children or forced labor workers uh, to harvest the cocoa, and they have to knowingly or, or recklessly disregard this illegal act. So we, we are literally weeks away from filing a new case against all of the major cocoa companies, calling them all an illegal venture, and uh, I think that that is going to be a very dynamic uh, event for us. Uh, we also just use regular what we call common law that uh, we can sue the companies for kidnapping or battery or emotional distress if we can show that they are responsible for the use of child slaves or child labor. Uh, there are a few legal reasons why that's not entirely attractive. Uh, the common law has a very short statute of limitations, for example. Uh, the alien tort statute and the trafficking statute have a 10-year statute of limitations. So it's, it's very hard to get there quickly uh, in a year or two when a kid has just been returned from uh, being trafficked. So that the, the longer statute of limitations is an advantage. But this is a perfectly acceptable tool legally. We recently filed a new case uh, against uh, Nestle using our consumer laws. Uh, our consumer laws tend to be very hard to use in the sense that you have to show that you as the consumer were harmed. So that if I bought uh, a cocoa bar that had uh, some poison or some bacteria in it and I got sick. That's the easiest case in the world. You, ha you have, as a consumer, been harmed by the product. Consu uh, green uh, uh, advocates for uh, environmental causes and so on particularly have used the environmental laws to establish a new kind of harm. We would call it a psychic harm. That if I buy a chocolate bar and I learn that it was hard, it was produced by child slaves, that it doesn't matter that the candy bar only costs 50 cents. I am psychically harmed by that. I have been injured in my uh, use of this chocolate bar. So that's our, our legal theory. It's a, it's a bit novel. Uh, this is the first case like this that we think has a chance. And then our second theory is that we, we can now prove, because I've been spending a lot of time documenting with photos and other uh, and, and interviews of people, that the companies have become emboldened by the fact that nothing has happened to them yet. So they're starting to do things like put on their labels, child labor free or fair trade produced. And it's a lie. So we are also basing our, our consumer case on the affirmative misrepresentation to the consumers about how the cocoa bar was made. I'm just, these are just the elements. I'm going to pass those by. Uh, this Tariff Act we have of 1930, uh, it allows for products to be banned from importation that are produced by forced labor. Uh, 
a long story short is that it used to be, though, that the United States would not enforce the law if there was not sufficient domestic production. So there is no domestic production of cocoa. Uh, Bernie Sanders, again, as a, a member of Congress, he plugged that hole up for us, that it no longer matters if there is sufficient domestic consumption. Uh, the problem now is that once that hole was plugged up, uh, the enforcement of the law depends upon the executive branch, and we all kind of uniformly agree, those of us working on human rights issues, that as long as uh, Trump is occupying that office, that it would be a waste of time to try to use these kind of trade laws, but we will. It'll take us five minutes to file a new complaint as soon as we have a new president. <laughs> And there's also a complaint you can make to the International Trade Commission. Similarly, you have to show that a product was made uh, using some kind of illegal process. Using slave labor is in, in an illegal process. So we could get them to ban the product and to fine the company, but we are not uh, pursuing that during the present administration. So we're left still with an ongoing problem. Th these photos, that I'm about to show, I at least have this one, uh, were from just March. Two months ago, uh, I went back and uh, we are just continuing to document that nothing is changing and that uh, I can walk onto any plantation and just pull out my camera and take pictures like this. They're still not even trying to hide it, which is Kind of, kind of shocking that even today, 2019, there's child slaves who were trafficked. We are not yet using, and this is one of the issues I really wanted to discuss more with the group, it's not a legal issue, we are not using effectively uh, the consumer boycott. And it mystifies me as to how hard it has been to get people to care about this. We show the picture. Everybody says, oh, that's terrible. And then they go to the grocery store and they put Nestle products in their, in their cart. And we've been studying. I personally have been studying how boycotts work, why they do, why they don't. And most of the people who are studying sort of the science of boycotts, they're, they're pretty cynical about uh, the, the value of trying to use a boycott. Uh, this one expert, uh, Maurice uh, Schweitzer, is a professor at the uh, Wharton School in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's written quite a few papers on it, and he basically says uh, they lack a sustained effort, uh, people lose interest or stop paying attention, and that uh, part of the problem is there are maybe too many calls for boycotts, and consumers just go like, oh, that's too complicated, you know, I'll, I, I can't figure out which ones are serious, etc. But it's really something. Uh, we've looked at trying to figure out what makes a successful boycott, and it seems that uh, certainly you have to have a clear problem, and I think we do. Child slavery is pretty clear. Uh, and you have to be able to find a brand that is responsible for it. And so we have all these horrible companies that are responsible for it. Uh, we are going to narrow it down to three because they are the big consumer brands in the United States, at least, and globally. Uh, Hershey's, Mars, and Nestle. And Nestle, I think, is the worst player in, in this market as well as in many other markets. You might remember the baby formula scandals and Nestle is, is a horrible company. So we have that. We have brands that are very susceptible to consumer pressure if we can figure out what's missing. Why, why isn't it so easy to do? The Nike boycott is a, is a very good example of a successful boycott. Nike was using child labor in Indonesia and in Vietnam. They were using glues that caused cancer. They lied about it all and they got caught red-handed. So Nike did a I will never, no one in my family, no one I know uh, will ever be permitted to wear Nike. 
because I worked on this campaign a long time ago, and I will never forgive them for personally lying to me and to many of my colleagues about what they were doing. But I got to hand it to them. They did a pretty good job of turning it around. They, they, they did go in there. They did clean up their supply chain. And I think that uh, if you went into a Nike supplier today, you'd be satisfied that uh, the conditions are pretty decent. So if you've not been personally burned by them, you might feel okay wearing uh, Nike. But the fact is that was a good campaign. It worked. And it required the company to seriously change practices. So we're, we're looking at that as, as a model. And I would say, so our campaign has many favorable elements. Why, why it doesn't work, we're going to discuss. But uh, we have the solid evidence. We have the pictures. We have giant corporations admitting that they have, at least since 2001, when they promised to stop and they didn't, they admit that they have been using child slaves all of this time. We have excellent visuals of young children who were trafficked that are using hazardous tools to harvest the cocoa. We have Mickey's films. We have other verifications. There's no question that we're not making this up. It is true. Uh, we have an optional product. You don't need cocoa, or if you do, there's other cocoa you can buy that isn't harvested by slaves, particularly cocoa coming from South America. Uh, we have highly visible and vulnerable brands, Nestle, Mars, Hershey. We have parallel legal actions to put some pressure on the companies to do something, and the problem is solvable. It's not necessary to harvest cocoa with child slaves. You could pay everybody a fair wage. We've done the math that you could multiply the amount of money that they pay a farmer for a kilo of cocoa. You could multiply that by five times, and it would add four cents to the retail cost of a chocolate bar. Nothing. But it's not being done because the companies don't want any price increase that they don't, they're not absolutely required to make. They're not going to do a voluntary good act is pretty clear. So we still are looking at this kid and wondering why nobody cares. <laughs> I just throw in here that, that you don't want to write down that whole thing, but uh, I can give it to anyone who wants it. But the Washington Post, our, our, one of our premier newspapers, just did an, an amazing story about this. I, I was their source. I worked with them in our last trip there. Amazing photos. So we're hopeful that that will help us kickstart a, a real campaign against these companies. What are the challenges to a successful campaign? What are, our, what are our problems? The first is a lack of dedicated funding. We are, a, and the people we are working with, small nonprofit human rights groups, uh, to fund a campaign that is actually going to be uh, successful requires real money. Uh, we have we are competing against uh, some of the biggest corporations in the world and their their public relations departments they have whole departments that we are dealing with uh the challenge is getting complacent so-called busy people to care about uh, slave children that are working in a faraway country that they don't even know where it is on a map uh, I, I do find that when I'm talking about this and I tell people about Cote d'Ivoire, a lot of people have no idea where that is. Uh, the mainstream media is afraid largely of uh, going after these companies because they are some of their primary advertisers. Uh, Hershey's, Mars, Nestle uh, do a whole lot of advertising. We lack uh, committed opinion leaders. Uh, we've, we've tried in many, many times to get someone to agree to be sort of the face of this campaign, and we still really haven't. Uh, and then did I mention uh, the, the lack of funding? That, that really is uh, the primary issue that we face. So I'm at, I always ask people at the end, uh, you know, what can you do to help? What can anyone do to help? Uh, funding assistance, referrals to others, communication advice, referrals to opinion leaders, messaging ideas. Those are all things that we are very open to hearing about in terms of a discussion. And uh, I have our contact information here. And if anyone would like to have this PowerPoint, I will email it to you. It is not uh, in any way proprietary. Um, I, I would conclude by saying that Nestle and her, uh, the, the cocoa 
issue that we're talking about, it is one of our many cases. Uh, we have a case against uh, Chiquita Brands for they partnered with paramilitary groups in Colombia to provide security during the Civil War, and these paramilitary groups killed thousands of people. We represent 3,000 families there. Uh, we have a lawsuit against ExxonMobil for privatizing a battalion of the Indonesian military on the island of Aceh to protect their natural gas facilities there. And they tortured and murdered people in the community that were suspected of being uh, guerrillas. We have cases against uh, Drum and Coal, which is not a brand name, but a giant coal company down in Colombia for likewise partnering with paramilitary groups. We have... Uh, we're, we're going to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo in August, where they mine cobalt for every gadget that we all have, every computer, every iPhone, every battery that's out there, they have cobalt in them, and that cobalt is mined by children and forced laborers. All of the big tech companies like Apple uh, and uh, Google, they, they all know this, but they claim that uh, they can't do anything about it and they buy their cobalt from China. So the cobalt is improperly mined. It goes to China where it is processed, and then they buy it from China, so they think that absolves them, and we're going to trace that supply chain. But those are just a few of our cases. We are, we are a small group, but the challenges are enormous in trying to hold corporations accountable. And my I am an optimistic person, but I am a cynical lawyer. I, I now believe that there is no corporation on earth that I'm aware of that would do the right thing if you, unless you made them. Uh, the profit motive and the power of capitalism is something that obliterates uh, uh, decency if you let it run wild. And the global economy is run by the law of the jungle. And if you look where companies go to get cheap labor, they are there because they can get away with it. They can get away with exploiting workers. And we, are, we, we have not changed that dynamic. All we can do is shine a light on some of the worst problems that there are. So I'll stop there and uh, hope that we have some good questions and suggestions for my mission in life. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me uh, like that there has been a lot of complacency by the government in those countries. So I'm wondering, because you did not talk about the local government and what kind of role they are playing uh, in stopping uh, child labor or child slavery. And whether you're also taking the fight to them or you're just narrowing it uh, onto the companies that are doing business. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. Um, generally speaking, the companies, when they go to a place like Cote d'Ivoire to harvest cocoa, they, they take care of their business there. They, they make sure that the government is on board. They're, they're, the corruption levels are incredible. Uh, the government of Cote d'Ivoire's official position is that there is no child slavery. I, I was... Um, I was just uh, there and I met with uh, a ministry official and, and he, he gave me a tour of a child rehabilitation facility that was completely empty. It was brand spanking new, paid for by donor dollars, and there were no kids there. And he, I, he kept dodging my question. And I finally said, no, really, really, why aren't there any children here? Oh, we are doing such an excellent job. There is no child slavery. There are no traffic children. And I, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I, just down the road, I hear some pictures. Let me show you. But they, they bribed the officials. I think the, the better example because they're in Cote d'Ivoire because that's where the cocoa is. But if you look at where the big chains are going to manufacture garments, uh, you know, we, we've chased them all over the world. They're in Bangladesh now in a big way. They're going to, uh, they're in, they were in Vietnam, but they're starting to move to Bangladesh. Uh, they, they go where they think they can get away with it. They make sure that the government is friendly. The government's not to be completely negative. If you're Bangladesh and these companies approach 
you and say, we're going to move uh, a million garment jobs here. Uh, we'd like your cooperation. So the companies presented as jobs. And so even a, a good faith uh, a, a minister of labor proceeding in good faith might say like, well, even if they're exploitative jobs, it's better than no jobs. Time. They'll, they'll give them four or five years or 10 years before they start cracking down. But so the short answer to your question is the companies make sure that they have taken care of the government officials so they don't have any problems. And they, they're very effective at it. Terry, you mentioned right at the beginning about how these kids are being trafficked in from Mali and uh, from Burkina Faso. Those trafficking networks, do they, I mean, have you come across any evidence that they overlap with the people smugglers bringing migrants up through the Sahara into to Europe? Or the, are they connected with any other trafficking um, uh, networks uh, within Africa. Thank you. That's, that's a good question. We are almost positive that the traffickers in this cocoa sector are, are very specific to the cocoa sector. Uh, there are several points along the borders that are known as the collecting points. So the, the traffickers will go into Mali and spread the word that there are good jobs in Cote d'Ivoire and they, they actually use a big van and they'll collect uh, 20 boys and take them to one of the collection points. Uh, Sikasso in Mali is one of the bigger ones where all the bus stations are. And they, they these traffickers have relationships with specific uh, plantation owners. The plantation owners will say, I need 10 kids, I need five kids. And they, they really just do a delivery service. But we did look into that. I was curious about whether there was any sex trafficking involved too because all all i never once saw a female trafficked child working on a cocoa plantation they're all boys so i cynically thought well there must be a flip side to this they're trafficking the girls somewhere else but i, I never found any evidence of that so i think it's a very low skilled trafficking operation that is operating on a very simple basis Um, I was wondering, given what, what we were uh, hearing yesterday also from Wolf about uh, the situation here in Italy and all of these legal options that you had outlined um, earlier on, you know, is there potential there for the slaves who are not necessarily child slaves, um, but they certainly are slaves um, in this country uh, for somehow then you know action to be taken that would be put it on the map that would you know move things along Maybe just ask, is it a related question Ellie? Yeah. I, I want i wanted to ask uh, your opinion about the possibility of introducing national legislation or multinational legislation like happened in france that in where in 2017 if i'm not mistaken, uh, a national uh, legislation will be introduced in order to force the parent companies to exercise due diligence on the whole supply chain in order to guarantee at the end of the day, uh, under the French regulation, in, for the fact they are the parent company is a French one, and so to exercise the national jurisdiction over the company, even if the company is, is supplied by companies that are based in other countries. But under the principle of if it's your supply chain, you have to be liable for it. Thank you. Thanks. Those are both very good questions. The, um, <clears throat> the, the fact is that <clears throat> we have just generally speaking first, and then I'll, I'll move to the specific. We have been looking for quite some time for equivalent partners, sort of volunteer nonprofit lawyers to help bring cases or develop cases in Europe. And there, there isn't the tradition 
of nonprofit lawyers or human rights lawyers. And so that's been a, a real cultural difference that we, we in, in, in the United States, there's probably too many uh, nonprofit legal groups because we're a very litigious society. But uh, that's been a, a, a block for us is trying to find partners to work with. We did have a breakthrough in France. Uh, uh, there's a group there called Sherpa. Uh, that does uh, amazing uh, nonprofit legal work, and we have partnered with them. They were actually our partners in the first case that I mentioned, uh, the Unical case. We sued Unical in the United States. They sued Total in France, and then we came to a joint uh, uh, settlement agreement with all the companies. So that is generally what the problem is. But each country, certainly in Europe, has sufficient laws on the books that outlaw slavery or forced labor or kidnapping or any of the other things I've mentioned, that if there were lawyers who were interested in uh, bringing such cases, I'm confident that the law is there to support it. It's just that they have the same barriers that we talked about. You got to have funding, you got to have uh, the, the resources to go find the problem and develop the evidence and so on. But there's no conceptual reason why that can't occur. And that's one of uh, uh, the things that I spend some time working on. There have been, though, some good legal developments. Uh, France led the way with this new supply chain law in passed in 2017. The Dutch just passed an identical or nearly identical law uh, about two weeks ago. So there, that could be a, a very promising trend. And th what these laws do is they, they, they require you, first of all, to disclose your supply chain. So it makes it transparent. And so that someone like me could take look at that and say, trace it back, see if they're neglecting and they're lying about it or they're not fully uh, uh, exposing their own supply chains. And then there are penalties for uh, if someone shows that their supply chain is in violation of one of the legal standards. So that that is a good trend. We used to spend quite a bit of time at uh, uh, international UN type organizations, the ILO in particular, the International Labor Organization, trying to work on a global uh, regulation that would bring some of these concepts to a global forum. And each time, it's, it's very frustrating that the standards that were developed in the UN Global Compact, for example, it, it governs global commerce and, and multinational companies, the UN Global Compact. The standards are beautiful. They really are specific, nice standards, but there's no enforcement mechanism whatsoever. So you spend an enormous amount of time bringing one of these complaints, and the result is everyone says, yeah, that's that happened, but there, there's no uh, uh, penalty uh, other than some kind of public shaming, which I don't think you can shame these people very, very easily. So uh, that is a, an ongoing challenge. I, I'm afraid in, it's not just my opinion. It's just sadly obvious that the trend is moving away from international regulation and back to nationalism. So I think working one by one with the European company or countries to try to develop a legal culture and find partners there is probably a more productive way uh, for coming at the problem. Yes. First of all, just amazing, Terry. So uh, congratulations. I think it's really heroic stuff that you're doing. Um, and offline, I can talk to them. I can make some connections uh, and advice. I, don't know if it's right, I, don't know. Um, I mean, it's actually interesting. Cause I'm, it's interesting to think about what happened with smoking. Uh, so, you know, there were legal attempts. They're still very, very important. There were lots of pu public education, health education, behavior change attempts. Um, then there was an insane idea uh, that perhaps smoking itself could be banned in public places. A friend of mine who I'll connect you with wrote the first uh, smoking ban legislation in the U.S. I think it was in Minneapolis, and she's in D.C. Um, I remember when I, I was around when all that stuff was being talked about, and I thought, and I believe in large change, I thought this is just impossible. And now you can't even smoke in Nairobi. So the, the scale of transformation is actually very considerable. I, what I wanted to ask you about, though, was 
um, on the legal front, on the consumer uh, protection side, the idea of psychic psychic injury. Has that ever been uh, tested or applied yet? There have been some environments. Sorry. There have been some environmental cases where a pollution case where the, 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 the plaintiff, the person suing, didn't own the river, but it was in a park, for example, and they were able to show that they had suffered this psychic injury because they enjoyed the park before and their enjoyment was, was interfered with. So that's a bit more concrete, like I used to be able to swim in this river and now I can't. It's not that big a leap to say I used to enjoy uh, chocolate bars until I learned that they were produced by uh, child slaves. We, we will be making, you know, the way the common law works is, you take a case and it seems pretty clear like, okay, you can't enjoy the river anymore. And then someone has to try to push that line out just a little bit more. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But we have in our consumer case, I, I teamed up with, and this is typically how I survive. I come up with an idea and then I find the best consumer lawyer in the country to join the case with me and uh, they enjoy trying to be part of some kind of uh, progressive uh, change. So we, we've we hooked up with the consumer lawyers who who brought those green cases and uh, they're, they're pretty optimistic we're going we're gonna to do something with it. I, I can't wait to report to our success. Hi. Um, I work in an international organization that is dealing with human rights, and I also have experience in ILO. And in both the premises of this organization, we can buy only Nestle products or Mars products. So <laughs> I think this affects also the way that we can be effective in changing the mainstream mentalities if people see already double standards uh, in these uh, organizations. How can we, <laughs> I, I mean, as, as an employee, of course, we try to speak about these things, but um, it's not necessarily enough. So I don't know, is there any possibility to um, make it maybe a more public issue that these comp these organizations that still are working on the on human rights and are allegedly the defender of these uh, human rights are not doing it then in their to come to the council yeah, of exactly. europe and make a presentation well the, the funny thing is that when the, the very funny thing is that just before you spoke, actually, I was checking Facebook and one of the employees shared the article that you just mentioned. So there is conscious inside, but it's n it never managed to, to reach um, a change. Well, thank you. That is a, a great suggestion, and I have a few comparable situations to describe uh, that, uh, well, first of all, w people who work in the organizations like you're talking about, they can't confront the power structure there very easily. They would risk their own jobs. So we call those people whistleblowers, and what we need people to do is send information to us, like, who is the power center there? How would we approach the organization? What would be effective uh, to try to get the organization to say as an institution that supports uh, the non-exploitation of children, we should not be purchasing this product. That's a very good idea. The one comparable situation I can, I can cite is that we sued uh, Coca-Cola 10, 15 years ago for uh, likewise using paramilitary groups in uh, Colombia to not only protect their trucks, but they murdered all the union leaders that were leftist union leaders. So a bunch of um, students in the United States, they had already been organized. They were called, the, they still exist, the United Students Against Sweatshops. And their model was they were trying to stop Nike first and then Adidas and several other companies from selling to their universities 
uh, athletic clothing and because of all the football teams and basketball teams and supplies because they had sweatshop uh, supply chains. And so they used the power of the students to approach the administrations of the schools and say, you can't buy Nike. And, and it really worked. Uh, they united and got like a hundred schools to not buy Nike and then not buy Adidas. And that was why the Nike campaign worked. So that model could work very well in, in virtually any institution if you could get uh, the right presentation made and the right pressure, public pressure put on them. But I, I had not thought of that before, but to approach the ILO and say, how can you allow a Nestle bar in your building when you have a convention 187 that prohibits hazardous forms of child labor, let alone slave labor? Um, that That's a brilliant idea. So to the extent that you can quietly help me to understand how to approach your organization, but I think that is a, that is a great idea. Thank you. In a similar vein, you mentioned earlier the use of phony fair trade logos. Um, that's also a practice in Italy when it comes to tuna. For example, if you look at the tuna that is marketed here, only one of them uses the internationally recognized Dolphin Safe uh, logo. All the others have got something that looks very like it, but actually isn't. And I just wondered whether there's any kind of international regula regulatory body, um, that, because th that, that would seem to be fraud. Um, how could you deal with it? How can you deal with it? <clears throat> Thanks. Well, that gives me a chance to rail a little bit against fair trade, too. Be, but uh, I'm not aware of any international regulation that would prohibit certain labels from being on the products, but it is fraud. And so our consumer case against Nestle is based in part on their representation that they are fair trade, but they specifically say that uh, child labor free uh, is part of fair trade, which is a lie. Um, and so I don't know about fair trade in the rest of the world, but in the cocoa sector, uh, both fair trade and Rainforest Alliance are complicit in the fraudulent presentation of the conditions of work. And that's in our lawsuit uh, that we're about to file. Uh, fair trade and Rainforest Alliance, they both say that they, they are claiming that they are causing a higher amount of money to be paid to the farmers for the cocoa. There are two things that, that might be true. Let's say it is. There's no requirement. So here you have a farmer. He's using trafficked child slaves. He's using a trafficker to bring him the child slaves. So he's getting $10 a kilo whatever. So you say, all right, we're going to solve this problem. Let's give him $15 a kilo. No one is making him not use child slaves. He thinks that's the greatest joke in the world. He just got paid more money, but his labor cost is still zero. So there's no requirement in fair trade in their fine print that you don't use child labor. It is all about providing a more subsistence level of support for the farmer. So that's one thing. Second, the number of farms, we, we have documented this with photos and no one denied it when I interviewed the fair trade people, that they don't have enough fair trade, quote, cocoa to, to meet the demand. So they end up filling up the rest of the bags with whatever cocoa there is. There's nobody there stopping them from doing that. So it's a double fraud, but so many consumers think that fair trade means something meaningful. So all of the candy bars that have a fair trade label on them, that just means that the slaver who produced that uh, cocoa has got paid more money. So you've basically rewarded the slaver. Uh, it does nothing to help the children, nothing. Charlotte. Um, I think that um, Michele is going to address some of these, these questions because he actually deals specifically with the way things are labelled. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that it is quite extraordinary that as a 
producer of food products, I have to pass, all of my products have to pass extremely rigorous health and safety requirements to make sure that the food is edible and properly prepared for human consumption. So we're all forced to do that. Nestle is forced to do that. All producers of food are forced to do that. So I find it extraordinary that we cannot regulate the conditions of the people um, and the work conditions and how illegal that is uh, in the same way that the health and safety rules are applied. Do you want to add? Oh, sorry. Well, no, I think that that's well. Yes, thank you. It, I, the reason we have necessity for fraud is that there's no rules in in Cote d'Ivoire that are governing their conduct, apparently, but they do have to comply with. For example, U.S. law in in their advertising, so they're they're claiming that they are in compliance and they're not. So I think fraud still remains the the one angle that we have there, uh, and to try to get other countries to bring cases against them as well is uh, is the the most fruitful thing. That they need pressure from places other than uh, the one market where we are. Sorry, I I also might just suggest, because we're running a bit late, and in the interest in finishing for lunch, maybe one, two, and... Yes, okay. I think we might just have Karen, and then Mr. Kelly's just arrived, so... Thanks. Um, yes, I just wanted to um, go back to the source of the problem, and you're attacking Nestle and the other big companies quite rightly, but is there any way of stopping the trafficking? Is there any way of going to... The source of these children and saying it's not what you think it is don't go i mean what are they told is going to happen to them when they turn up to get in these trucks and surely they don't this is not what they're expecting it, education on the ground to to cut off the source to give them alternatives so they don't have to get in those trucks is is that a, a viable way of you know of, of breaking this this chain Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. We actually have a, like a eight point uh, solution to the problems that we are trying to get companies to adopt, and that is one of the uh, the points. Is that in my last trip just now? But I always do this. I went to Sakaso, which is in Mali. It's about uh, six miles from the border with Cote d'Ivoire, and that's where they collect the boys. And they're, the, they're all told that there's a good job and they'll be paid. They, they jump in the van because there's no work in Mali, so they, they have no trouble getting the kids to jump in the van. <clears throat> but I went to the bus station, and you could see it's a huge bus station. There's gangs of young boys, 12, 13 years old. They're just roaming around looking for something, some kind of odd job. <clears throat> and... I gathered a bunch of them up. I, I have photos of this, and I, I asked them, first of all, how many people know where Cote d'Ivoire is? And very few of them even knew that Cote d'Ivoire was six miles away. Uh, and I asked them if they had heard about the, the cocoa jobs, and none of them had heard anything one way or the other about the cocoa jobs, because they had not been personally exposed yet. And then I said, so if I offered you a job, for the equivalent of $50 a year is what the promise is that is not kept. That's all it takes, $50 a year. These boys jump in the van because they're like $50 a year. So uh, they, they, they don't know that, and they don't know that they're going to be lied to. So, yeah, that costs money, though. The government of Mali would have to do it. Somebody would have to fund an education program, and we're trying to get the companies to do that. But it is something that simple would be very effective, just putting signs or warning people in some systematic way. My, my colleague, Mickey, has arrived, uh, the filmmaker, and uh, you missed my presentation, but uh, you've heard it before. <laughs> 
Yes, I'm good.